Great. Thanks, Carol. It's a, uh, and hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this evening. Uh, I've been watching all the other lectures, so I feel like I'm, uh, I'm humbled to be included in the, the list of engineers and architects that, that have already spoken in this series. But um, I wanted to uh, give you an idea of what I'm going to try to cover here uh, this evening in the limited time we have. I'd like to do a little bit of history at the beginning uh, and then use the Jetta Tower as an example of all of the things that we as structural engineers uh, do, uh, the, most, the most critical issues in terms of formulating a structure and then designing it and seeing the construction through for something uh, of, of such a magnitude. And then maybe toward a little bit th uh, sprinkled throughout the uh, 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 program, I'd like to say a few things for, perhaps about the future. So. The, gen the, the general idea is a little peek behind the curtain of, as, at what, what we do as structural engineers. But let me let me start by, uh, I'm the one that uh, came up with this title and uh, I don't have a, a particular height for what ultra tall is. I think it's gonna change over time, but ultra tall to me is a structure that's significantly taller than any other structure that has been built previously. And so Jetta Tower would certainly be, uh, if it were built, in practically a class of its own and that from that standpoint. So that's what I call ultra tall. It's something that's beyond what has been done in the past. So let's let's talk a little bit uh, on some of the same lines that, that Carol was just talking about. Uh, what's what's happened? Uh, you know, I've been in the business 36 years, but uh, you know, the John Hancock building as here in Chicago has been in service for 50 years. Um, and so if you look at buildings like the Hancock building and the World Trade Center Twin Towers, the original ones, they were not only steel structures and entirely steel, the only concrete in those buildings is the floor slabs. Uh, but they were also very expressive architecturally of the structural engineering behind them. For example, the Hancock building, you can't imagine a, a building that uh, doesn't scream exactly what the structure is. You can see it there. Doesn't have, you don't have to be a genius to figure it out. And I would say in some ways equally, although a little bit more subtly, uh, World Trade Center with the close uh, columns, uh, grid-like columns uh, on the outside of the building equally expresses what the structure for that tower is. I think you can pretty well read both of those. Now you come forward in time uh, to a tower in Kuala Lumpur that my firm uh, designed, the Petronas Twin Towers, and of course the Burj Khalifa that was completed in uh, 2008 in Dubai. Um, those buildings are primarily concrete. And uh, certainly Petronas Tower is the only thing that steel is the floor beams. Uh, all of the columns on the perimeter and the spandrel beams and the core are all concrete. And Burj Khalifa, everything is uh, concrete with the exception of the, the upper 200 meters or so, which is, is, is structural steel. But I think equally, uh, you'd be hard pressed, even as a structural en engineer to you know, pinpoint what the structure is for those two towers if you had read a little bit about them as, a, as an engineer. So not only did the technology change, but also architecture changed as well. Uh, here's, a, here's a lineup that you see a lot of in different formats, but Jetta Tower uh, will be uh, not only the, the world's tallest building when it's completed, but it will also be the first man-made structure to reach one kilometer in height. So you see the venerable uh, Sears Tower there. It's uh, not quite half as tall as Jetta Tower. So as you, as you start to think about the magnitude of what we're trying to do with ultra tall towers, it's, it's quite different than what has been done in the past. And even Taipei 101 was the world's tallest building at one time. Uh, our firm designed the Shanghai Tower, which is roughly 600 meters. But what I'm gonna to try to do is describe many of the advances that have taken place, uh, certainly over my career, and even over the last 10 to 15 years. A lot of them are in systems, in wind tunnel testing, in construction, uh, in terms of uh, geotechnical engineering and these types of things. But a lot of them 
have to do with very significant advances, in my opinion, in the development of systems and mixed designs and delivery methods and construction methods for reinforced concrete construction. And that will be one of the focuses on the, for the talk tonight. Now let's just, uh, let's, let's turn our attention there then to Jeddah. And uh, the picture on the left is uh, Prince uh, Awali bin Talal. He's the, he's the mastermind for the tower. He'd originally proposed and uh, had a competition uh, for a mile high tower in Jeddah. And after the competition was completed, uh, the conclusion was it was simply infeasible uh, from a construction and cost standpoint. So they had a new competition uh, for, for a Jeddah Tower. This is actually during the uh, beginning of piling on site. The, our foundation drawings are there right in front of uh, Prince Al-Walid. You may have seen him. He's, uh, he's on uh, CNN quite a bit here in the United States and around the world. He's, uh, he's uh, the people call him the, the Saudi Warren Buffett. He's a, he's a big investor and in, in, in securities and so forth, particularly US-based companies. But, but Jeddah is on the uh, opposite side of the Arabian Peninsula from Dubai. It's over on the, the Red Sea side. And Jeddah is the, uh, is the entry point for the uh, pilgrims who go to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. So it's a very, very critical uh, uh, city uh, in, the, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The, the competition was for not only uh, a tower, a uh, one kilometer tall tower, but there's a whole uh, master planning and development of a, a completely vacant site currently that was part of the uh, design. So this is basically at the time of the master planning and the competition, this was uh, Adrian and Gordon's design uh, for the tower and how it might fit within, within the master planning uh, as a whole. Now, uh, it's important to note that uh, a lot of the towers uh, historically in the 70s and 80s, the taller ones, most of them uh, were, were office buildings. They were corporate headquarters. Uh, and then uh, slowly but surely, uh, more of the taller towers started to become residential uh, buildings. This is a mixed building, but it's primarily residential. And um, you have a little bit of office at the bottom of the building uh, where the floors are, are the largest. And then you have a small, uh, very uh, high-end hotel, a few service departments, and then the rest is essentially uh, residential units over the rest, the entire height of the tower, up until about 650 meters in height. And then you have penthouse for uh, perhaps the prince. It's you know, it, it hard to say right now, but that's probably uh, who will be occupying many of the uh, upper levels uh, as a uh, executive suites and, and the penthouse itself. So that's, that's the basic program for the tower. Now, if you, uh, if you remember one slide uh, from the talk this evening, I recommend you remember this one. Because if you, uh, if you really wanted to understand what the system or the structure is for Jeddah Tower, everything you need to know is pretty much in this one slide. Uh, I, I, uh, I call it a bearing wall because a bearing wall it, to me is, is almost a, it's a code term actually. It means that the gravity loads are being resisted by a wall system. And in this particular case, uh, the walls also resist all the lateral loads. It's not, there's no beam column frames or diagonal bracing or anything like that in the system. It's basically vertical walls uh, resisting all the, all the forces on the building. Now, there's no columns in the building at all, it's, it's all walls. Uh, many of the super tall buildings and uh, some of the tallest buildings, including Shanghai Tower and many others around the, the world have outriggers. They have a very strong and outriggers which have been described in, in some detail on in several of the other uh, previous talks. Jetta Tower has no, no outriggers whatsoever. It has no columns that transfer or planted. That means, uh, there's no column that comes down and sits on a transfer beam and then moves, moves from side to side. All the floors are, are flat plate construction. There's, uh, it's not a, not a uh, beam system, it's all flat plate. There's no edge beam along the perimeter of the floor plate. Uh, it's basically just the slab that 
uh, uh, comes to the edge of the floor plate, uh, and that's that's it. There's no drop spandrel beam like you would see in a building like the World Trade, old World Trade Centers or Sears Tower, for example. All the stories on the tower are four, exactly four meters tall, whether they're residential or office or anything else. All the walls are connected. This is critically important. Uh, they're all connected by coupling beams that you can see them in the diagram here. They're very deep, actually. They're 1.5 meter to 1.6 meters deep, and they're very strong and very stiff. So the whole system is working together as a unit. Uh, it's, it's an all concrete structure. All the walls are vertical except the dark blue walls that you see there. Those are uh, organized around the, the fire egress uh, stairs at the ends of the three wings. So those are the ones that incline uh, over the height of the building. Everything else is vertical. So I, I've described it as, as, a, as, a, probably as, as pure or as simple uh, a system as you could possibly have. It's simple, but it's not simple minded. I like to tell people it's not, it, uh, there's a lot happening in the structure. There's a lot to deal with in terms of coordination, but it's everything, it's almost as if it, it, it's the system that had to be for a building of this height. A, a little bit more uh, history. Uh, I didn't invent the bearing wall. I, I can tell you that much. <laughs> uh, the bearing wall has been around a long time. And uh, these, are, these are three buildings that have a wall system of various types. Uh, certainly Burj Khalif and Jeddah there are a lot of similarities, no doubt about it. And there's a good reason for that, or several good reasons. They were, they were designed uh, one after the other. Uh, you know, we started uh, designing Jeddah Tower right about the time that uh, Burj Khalifa was finished. And we won it in a competition with the same architect that worked on Burj Khalifa. And the competition was being run uh, by uh, the same developer that developed Burj Khalifa. So uh, that shouldn't surprise anybody. There's a lot of similarities between the two, but there's some differences for sure. Uh, but if you really wanted to go back to a, a building uh, or a structure that's even more probably similar to Jetta Tower, you go all the way back to the early 70s and you'd go north of the border to Toronto and visit the CN Tower. These are pictures of the foundation plan. So as the building uh, sits on its foundation. This is what the wall systems look like for the three. And you can see that uh, the CN Tower is a little bit uh, taller than half of Jeddah Tower, but it has uh, some of the similarities and it has sort of a linear tapering, very smooth tapering versus the step profile that uh, Burj Khalifa has. It's, um, it has cross walls, as you can see, that basically divide the structure into let's call it uh, divisions or uh, uh, modules. It has very large elements at the ends of the three wings. You can see that there's a big black uh, rectangle at the end of the three wings of CN Towers. That's a two meter thick, almost a six and a half feet wall at the end of the three wings. On Jeddah, of course, we have the wall surrounding the fire stairs. Uh, and it's all concrete, the CN Tower, all the way. It's an all concrete tower. It's, although it's not a building, uh, it's a telecommunications and observation tower. It, 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 is, it is surely a bearing wall and a three-legged bearing wall at that. All three buildings have three legs and I'll, I'll get to why that's important as well. Here's how the building works. It, uh, you basically, most of the elevators, uh, Pete Wise Mantle went into this in some detail uh, last week, but you get into your elevators there's three separate lobbies, one for residential uh, hotel and office at the base of the building. So you can go into your lobby and you go into your elevator and, and, and then those elevators in the center uh, triangular core. And then you, you get out of your elevator and you lock, walk down a fairly long corridor, uh, depending on what floor you're at. And then you go left or right, either into your hotel room or your residential room. And those two corridors, uh, think of a hotel corridor, those corridors are exactly where the or some of the walls are all along those, those uh, corridors. And then you see the location of the egress stairs. It turns out uh, that those locations, those are certainly optimal structurally, as you can imagine. The, the, the concrete that we have at the ends and the extremities of the building is the most efficient 
concrete we can have because it res resists the highest uh, wind stresses and, uh, and high gravity loads on top of it. But um, it turns out that's an excellent place in terms of safety for if there was an emergency event and the, the floors had to be evacuated. Basically, each it's, it divides each floor into three three legs. So basically, if you're in the leg, you know you have to go to the end of the corridor to get out of the, get, get into the stair and out of the building or or to a, a safe floor. So that's basically how it works. And this is how it works uh, architecturally. You probably were thinking that you know these cross walls they must be a real pain to have to deal with to have those in your units. Uh, to live in those units and you constantly have to have some walls. This, each one of these green uh, is a three bedroom unit. So there's three bedrooms plus a small uh, bedroom for, uh, for a, uh, a live-in maids uh, uh, facility. They basically have live-in maids in, in, the, in the kingdom. And uh, you can see that if you have good interior designers like we have at ASGG, they're able to work around the, the walls quite, quite readily. It, you know, it, it divides bedrooms, of course, and it divides kitchens from, from living spaces and those types of things. And um, they're really, uh, not that it's easy to deal with them, but, but they certainly can be, be used uh, quite easily for residential use. If, if you're in an office and you need a completely open floor, that's a different story. But uh, that's why I say this type of system really really sings for a residential type occupancy uh, versus office. Uh, now let's keep going on how, how the geometry is defined. I mentioned that the three fire stair cores, they basically rise on an incline as one unit. They're, they're a constant on every floor. So it's really, the geometry is very simple. All of the things that we did for the system in terms of setting the walls, setting the story heights, uh, organizing the system, we're all done to do one thing, is to be built quickly and efficiently in terms of cost. And here's, a, here's another one. It looks complicated at the top of the building, but the geometry is actually very simple. At the bottom of the building, the three wings are the same length. So you start at the, at the foundation level, uh, the raft foundation, and all the wings are the same length. But the three wings then incline ever so slightly at different angles. And they're only two or three degrees to the vertical. And that's enough of an inclination that by, by the top, you can get a very uh, sculptured uh, a feature or, or character to the top of the tower. Because the three, since the three angles are different, that means the three uh, legs reach the top of the tower at different elevations um, by definition. And one thing we didn't have the possibility to do is to orient the tower in any way we wanted to. From, the, from day one of winning the competition, the tallest wing, the one that went all the way up to one kilometer was always going to be facing directly uh, to the Kaaba and, and uh, to Mecca. In, in Saudi Arabia, that was non-negotiable. So unlike some other towers where we can you know, change the orientation to help help with the wind forces. Not on this one. Uh, not only is it is it a, a simple system floor by floor, but vertically, it's one system. You know, a lot of buildings have uh, a tower and a flat roof and a and a stick, an antenna or a architectural spire. This one actually, it's one continuum. It's it's. It's, it's not two systems, it's two configurations of the same system. So basically what you see here, for the bottom 670 meters, that diagram that I showed you before is exactly what happens. But then as you, as you rise, the ends of the three wings get closer and closer together until about at 670 meters, they almost touch each other or they almost touch the triangular core and there, and from there on above, there are no habitable floors. It's essentially a completely enclosed concrete, I called it a silo. I don't know if the architects like that term very well, but it is, it's a closed windowless uh, structure. So it, it's a, a concrete spire basically. And th those walls continue up at that inclined angle all the way from the raft foundation 
to their termination points. Of course, there's a little bit of architectural infill in between the walls, uh, you know, to give it more interest, of course. But again, it's it's all concrete. There's no there's no steel portion of the of the spire as well. One other thing I'll just mention: it's going to be uh, it would be not only the tallest building, but also a very slender one. We we define slenderness as the ratio of the height to the uh, least least width at the base of the tower. Uh, so in this one, that's about 12 to one. Some of the buildings in New York City, uh, everyone, most of the people on the call know are quite a bit even more slender than that, of course. But this is considered to be very slender. Uh, going back, you know, the, the buildings like uh, Sears Tower and Hancock Building and the Old World Trade Centers, they were on the order of six or seven to one in aspect ratio. So things have changed dramatically. Uh, uh, over the last 15, 20, and even 30, 30 years. Here's a little picture of what happens. Those walls, you can see the, the end walls are getting closer and closer together, and, but they continue up uh, into the spire, really uninterrupted uninter uh, as, as planar elements. Now, the, the walls themselves have a bit of a hierarchy, so they have different, slightly different wall thicknesses, but they're, um, so I, I can kind of, so, so try in a way of trying to break it down, let's start with the torsional uh, core, the, the triangular core. Its biggest uh, benefit, it provides a lot of torsional stiffness to the building. And so several speakers have talked about that uh, for many different uh, towers. At the bigger, bigger the center port is that encloses the elevators, Structural engineers uh, gain a lot of benefit from that. It's nearly, that one's nearly solid because all of the elevators generally except at the base of the building open inward into the, the center of the triangular. So there's no reason to really have any openings you can see there. Those walls of the triangle are only 800 millimeters at, at the base of the tower. So that's about 32 inches. The, uh, then uh, extending out are the corridor walls that, that uh, end up uh, terminating in the fire stair walls. Uh, they are very highly stressed, as you might imagine. They have a corridor, uh, they have uh, coupling beams that are 1.6 meters deep uh, that uh, lead you into your residential unit. And those link beam, the pattern of those had to be carefully organized with the architects. I just couldn't put them any old wear so that they could um, make the units work better. They had to be centered uh, on top of each other vertically. So there was a lot of coordination that went into locating the coupling bands. Those walls uh, are one meter thick at the base, 39 inches. The cross walls, we call them fin walls, uh, are extremely important. They're, I would call them more stabilizers, but they have a uh, three span coupling beam that extends through the corridor space, uh, you know, above the above the corridor itself, um, those are the ones that drop off as the tower rises. So when the end wall gets too close to them, uh, then we simply drop it off. It doesn't transfer somewhere else. It simply disappears, and you you'll be able to see that in some of the pictures that I show in a little while. Those walls are 850 um, uh, millimeters. Uh, at the base. And then finally, the end walls. The end walls are, I mentioned before, are the most highly stressed because they, they're the furthest from the, the center of the building. There's no openings through those whatsoever. Uh, those are inclined along with the stair walls. They are 1.2 meters thick at the base. So th that's the thickest wall we have on the, on the tower. It's, it's about, four, about four feet, 48 inches. And, that, and that's kind of a tribute to the fact that you have walls throughout the, so the structure is distributed so that you don't have anything that's really, really uh, thick. Uh, materials are not that uh, uncommon for super tall buildings today. Uh, we get up to 12,000 PSI concrete. Uh, the rebar is normal. There's nothing unusual about the rebar. Uh, concrete, all the concrete now are are quite different uh, in terms of their uh, flowability and their ability to be pumped uh, for these, these projects. 
And um, what we do uh, nowadays for, for these towers, we not only specify the strength of the concrete, but we specify the stiffness. And uh, that's one of the things that uh, has come a long ways in concrete. Uh, and it's uh, it started probably with the Trump building right next door here, but uh, it continues to develop uh, how we specify concrete. These are these, I mentioned these are self-consolidating concrete. So as you pour them in the form, they basically consolidate themselves. There's no need for vibrators whatsoever. And uh, they have to be pumpable and placeable. And a lot of that is handled by chemical ag mixtures. The other thing is there are many different types of uh, supplementary, uh, supplementary uh, cementitious materials that are used in these concretes. So a friend of mine, uh, Bill Phelan from Euclid Chemical said, these concretes are, are uh, athletic concrete. They have to do so many different things to not only be designed for strength, but to be able to be placed at height and, uh, and reach strength and be able, to, uh, be able to be consolidated in the forms and many other aspects compared to what concrete was in 1970 or 1975. Just a, just a brief aside, um, the future uh, concrete has some real challenges. Uh, one is the um, is the is the embodied carbon issue, and particularly with Portland cement. And what happens with these very high strength concretes? A lot of times, you don't necessarily need the strength; you just need the stiffness. And so, what you what engineers end up doing, of course, is they they specify a very high strength, hoping they get the stiffness because there's a intrinsic relationship between the two. They basically go hand in glove. But there's research that we're involved in uh, with Northwestern University here in Chicago with the possibility of using carbon nanotubes that break that sort of paradigm and where you can actually get much stiffer concrete. We call it, we call it uh, high stiffness concrete without having the same strength gain. So that's just one of the things that will begin to be looked at in the future. And concrete is, is doing a lot of things uh, looking toward the future. There's no question about it. A little bit about uh, the design aspects. The seismic uh, hazard, uh, we call it low to moderate. It's, uh, there's, there are some faults, but most of the activity you can see there, uh, really heavy activity is up in Iran and Turkey, as you might imagine. There was some sort of far field uh, activity up near Sinai. All of it had to be accounted for, of course, but, but all of the sizing uh, was controlled by wind. And that's true for pretty much many, many of these very, very tall towers. So how do we start? Uh, we start with the basic wind speed and uh, we try to figure out what the wind climate is. So this is kind of Jeddah's there in the middle. Um, and these are uh, design uh, wind speeds basically from the code. Uh, and sometimes you can you can use a little bit lower value for some of the some of the issues, but but for the strength design, you have to use the code value. So you can see there, uh, the design wind speed is not that much different than many other places in the world, like Chicago and New York, but it's certainly not uh, areas like uh, Miami or Hong Kong, where you're susceptible to hurricanes and typhoons, for example. So not a bad place in terms of wind design. Uh, wind tunnel testing is is probably more than critical. It's it's crucial for these tall buildings. So we start with simple models. Uh, these are fixed base models at one to 800 scale. And we did that one as soon as we won the competition. Uh, and then we go to uh, one to 600 a model that's still a fixed base model, but it has pressure taps over the entire surface. It's uh, called a high frequency uh, pressure integration model. And then that model, we couldn't get enough taps. There's wires actually throughout the entire model into the upper part of the spire. So we had to do a half model. So that's what you see in that third slide. And then they numerically, they, they take the results of that and uh, patch them together with the other model. But, uh, and then the final model is not a fixed, but it's the only model that the, the model actually moves with the simulated properties of the tower itself. It's an aeroelastic model and that was it one to 600 scale, it's a very expensive model. And then we did another thing. We, uh, we did uh, companion wind tunnel testing at two different wind tunnel laboratories and tested the results. But, uh, and the results were, were quite similar. 
But one of the things we, we, we get on these other, these ultra tall towers, there's always something new that comes up. And what we've, what we found was that the um, RWDI was saying that uh, the uh, atmospheric boundary layer extends up to about 600 meters. And that's, that's basically defined as the wind speeds are very turbulent and they're highly influenced by the topography of the Earth's surface. But above that, the wind speed profile versus height is a little bit uncertain. So we ended up doing a bit of a research project and I'm not gonna take credit for RWDI's work. Uh, they, did, uh, they did more work on the historical wind records from the airport. They looked at balloon sounding. Uh, these are weather balloons, obviously, that are, that are lofted with uh, anemometers. And, but they also have a, a weather research forecast model, which is purely analytical. All of the, the meteorological records uh, throughout the world are, have been, been recorded since the early 70s. So they're able to take a analytical model backward match it to the terrain in Jeddah, and then try to predict the wind speed versus height uh, at our particular site. And what we found was that you can see the building code is the red line, the balloon data is the blue line. So those kind of matched, maybe not in magnitude, but certainly in profile. But the weather research forecasting model would imply that maybe the wind speeds, once they get beyond 600 meters, maybe don't increase uh, so much in magnitude. This is just the very first baby steps on this topic. We, ought, we certainly designed to the building code, but we wanted to make sure that we weren't getting to the opposite situation where the building code was not conservative enough. So I think we proved at least for now for this particular site, this particular structure, that we were, the building code is perfectly fine. But let me give you, give you the high, high point here. Uh, basically, the building is gonna be very, very comfortable. At, um, at a one year return period at the highest occupied floor, about 650 meters, uh, the, the ISO standard would allow you 12 millijis. We're predicting about five or six. So it's unbelievably uh, comfortable, amazingly comfortable, I would say, for something at 2000 uh, foot in height. And why is that? Well, concrete. It turns out that the accelerations are inversely, this is the only, uh, equation I have in the entire talk tonight. Uh, accelerations are inv inversely proportional to mass. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's, it's very simple. The, ma the mass of concrete is a huge benefit for reducing the motions in these very, very tall buildings. Now, the, the, the other question is what about the, why are we using three legs? Well, it turns out we think that the aerodynamic uh, characteristics of these three-legged towers are very beneficial. Basically, you have two different possibilities. The wind can come from uh, basically directly onto one leg or in between the legs. And both of those turned out to be uh, very benign in terms of their, in terms of the results, in terms of the motions and resistance to the vortex shedding phenomenon, a phenomenon that's been talked about by many, many, practically most of the other speakers. Now, but the one thing that we did find is that the occupants up to 650 meters are gonna be very comfortable, but as you go up into the spire, particularly the upper 100 meters or so, the motions could be uh, quite uh, noticeable. So we are planning for uh, a damper up there to reduce the motions in the spire itself, because there will be ma maintenance workers and uh, other people from time to time, certainly up in the spire. So we, we do plan on doing that. A little bit about the geotechnical conditions. It's basically, it's rock all, almost all the way to the surface. It's fairly weathered, but it's good. There's no bedrock per se, uh, but it's, it's good uh, geotechnical conditions. The foundations uh, are basically straight shaft board piles. Uh, they extend anywhere from 45 to 105 meters. Uh, there's 270 of them in a matrix, all uh, capped by about a 1.5 meter to 1.8 meter uh, mat foundation. We're expecting about 105 millimeters, about four inches of settlement. And one of the things you have to know about these types of situations is not only is the tower subtle, but everything around it too. So uh, to a lesser extent, as you get further and further away from the tower, 
but uh, we had to postpone some of this, the structures that are around uh, the tower itself. A couple of uh, items, just so people understand some of the other developments. We now actually build our towers you know, analytically in sequence in the computer. We don't just build it and then put forces on it. We actually do time step analysis. And this was not available uh, until about 10 to 15 years ago. It started to be developed. Uh, we use a, a, a program called Midas Gen, which is a Korean program, but some of the, some of the US-based vendors are starting to be able to uh, do this type of analysis. And that's important because loads will get redistributed uh, through these coupling beams and the wall system. So we have to be able to track it in a three-dimensional model rather than just a spreadsheet. Any place in the, in the structure, we can calculate stresses, uh, forces, and displacements. Uh, the concrete industry is starting to wake up to the fact that they've been doing reinforcing shop drawings the same way for the last hundred years <laughs> by hand. Uh, or a little bit of computer, but we need uh, building a information modeling for concrete and reinforcing. Uh, that's going to be something uh, that really needs to get going for ACI. A lot of people ask me, you must have had a lot of people working on the tower. And I said, this is it. This is the team that we had uh, here in Chicago. They're about 14, 15. You have to realize that these people aren't just working on the tower. They're also working on the podium, too. So perhaps half of these uh, folks at one time or another were working on the, all the structures which are extremely complicated around the base of the tower as well. Just, just a quick, uh, a few uh, construction photos here. Here we are at groundbreaking. There, there I am next to my colleagues, uh, Brian Jack, uh, Mehdi Jalliarian, and, and your speaker from last week, Pete Weismantel, uh, and a couple of representatives from the client group. That, that pole there is the geometric center of the tower, a beautiful winter day. They were able to wear their black suits. Uh, a little bit of piling. This is not a, this is one of the shorter piles, uh, but uh, this is pile load testing was going on uh, at this time when we were out there actually. So these are very early photos on, on pile load testing. Here, at least one, one wing is finished in terms of you see the, the heads of the piles uh, sticking up there. And then they, they, they basically put uh, foundation and prepare all the top heads of the raft of the piles uh, to accept the the reinforcing or the raft foundation. And then uh, here you see they're inspecting some of the reinforcement. This is only the bottom of the raft. The raft is five meters thick at the ends of the wings that you see here, so almost 16 feet thick. Uh, and it was poured in three. Uh, uh, four, four actually locations, the three wings, and then the central area was the last pour for the raft foundation. And this is, again, one of the big advancements for uh, reinforced concrete is the placing booms. So you got pumping, and so the uh, truck uh, rides up to the pump, and the pump goes into the line, and it gets placed with, with these huge placing booms pretty much anywhere they want to put it. And since it's self-consolidating concrete, you need very few workers actually, because the concrete will actually flow into position. So this is what a 16 foot thick raft foundation looks like under construction. And then you see the bars sticking up for the beginnings of the walls. The blue that you see there is insulation. They have to try to cure the concrete and limit the temperature gain uh, at the first few days. So they put insulation on the sides and the top, you can see two, two wings have been poured and the third one is in the process of being poured. And then we finally had a few of the walls. Uh, uh, the first walls came, we got these pictures back in Chicago and it was a great day to see the walls starting up. You can see a huge uh, pit for the foundations there uh, in the middle of the tower. Uh, here you can see some of the construction sequencing, the walls are going up, they're up about 25 stories. And the thing that you notice, there's no slabs. <laughs> so we, we have, we have uh, meetings every week with the construction team. And at one point, they started to say, Bob, don't you think we should put some slabs in? I said, well, eventually you're going to have to put some slabs in. And I don't want to downplay the, the importance of slabs. They are very important to the completed structure. But it just goes to show you that the system is extremely stable with the walls. Uh, but um, eventually, of course, the slabs caught up. But you can get an idea of the formwork systems. You can also see the sort of the prime, primary nature of the end walls at the ends of the three wings. Uh, you can uh, 
you can see that the, the central core is about five to seven stories uh, in front of the three wings. And this, the slabs are starting to catch up very quickly uh, with the construction. You can see that the formwork system allows uh, basically compartmentalization of all the wall construction, the wing walls and the corridor walls. It's a big status report uh, for now. It, there hasn't been any work since COVID started and even a few months before that too. It's at 260 meters in height. About 45% of the concrete has already been placed. And that's because you've got all the concrete for the piles and the raft foundation and the walls are thicker at the base and there's more of them. The, the floors are bigger. So 40, even though we're only, only a quarter of the way up, 45% of the concrete is in place. You can see at the bottom, the uh, exterior wall has been started. They usually start above the lobby levels because the lobby levels are more complicated. So they start at the typical floors. And on those floors, uh, drywalling and uh, services and finishes have already begun. A couple, just some closing comments. Uh, you know, um, tall buildings are one of the few you know, significant man-made structures uh, that are not tested at full scale. Certainly automobiles are tested in many different ways, including wind tunnel testing, but uh, other test, uh, tests for sure in terms of safety at full scale. Airplanes are tested at full scale in different ways in the shop and of course aloft. Uh, small scale buildings, you know, the, the universities are able to test uh, three, four story uh, buildings on shake tables and the like. And even some pedestrian bridges, this is the Millennium Bridge after the events of the, when it first opened, when they were testing it for the, uh, the fix. Even some pedestrian bridges and others are tested, at, can be tested at full scale, but of course you, these, these ultra tall towers, you can't do that. So the next best thing is, is to monitor them. So what the, what the profession and what the, the uh, building industry needs is better long-term structural health monitoring. And that, you know, we take these finite element models that we do in our design offices, then we do scale model wind tunnel tests at one to 600, one to 800. And then we build the tower at full scale without really, it's, it's hard for you to believe, but it's true that there's very little uh, feedback between the actual final building and whether our models actually, uh, actually predicted. We think so far that they, they generally predict things pretty well. And, and wind tunnels always, we think, has been reasonable and somewhat perhaps on the conservative side. But what the industry really needs is instrumentation. So on JEDA, uh, we've come up with a, a very extensive long-term structural health monitoring program with strain gauges, anemometers, because measuring things, if you don't know you know how they're correlated to wind speed is almost worthless. And those, those measurement devices are installed all the way from the bottom of the pile foundation to the top of the spire. And so far the client and the contractor has agreed to do that. And, but um, it's not only do we have to instrument the towers, but the, the information has to be allowed in the public domain. And that's always a tricky thing. So one last thing, I have to uh, address because it's, I've asked, people ask me all the time. This is, this is a picture of Frank Lloyd Wright's design for the Illinois Tower. And um, it's, it, was, it was a one mile high proposal, late 50s. <laughs> and I always, I always thought it was, it was a tongue in cheek type of a proposal. It, it, was, his, it was Mr. Wright's uh, way of saying, you guys showed me some towers, I'll show you a tower. And, uh, and he did, <laughs> but... Um, you know, people ask me, is it possible? And uh, I have to say I'm a bit, a bit skeptical. And the reason if you can kind of look here, you see Burj Khalifa there, that's 830 meters, more or less. It's uh, roughly one half of mile high. And anybody who's traveled to Dubai and looked at the tower, you just look at it in awe, you say, holy smokes, that, that is really, really tall. Uh, and it's much taller than any of the buildings in, in, in New York or Chicago or, or anywhere else here in the United States. Uh, some, of the, some of the Chinese uh, towers come somewhat close. Uh, then Jenna Tower is one kilometer, but that's only 20% taller, would only be 20% taller than Burj Khalifa. 
still, you'd have to go 60% taller than Jeddah Tower <laughs> to get up to mile high. So I think um, there's, there's questions about constructability. It's not designed, they've been designed before. I mean, the, but the question is, what, what do you mean by design? Have they really gone through rigorous wind tunnel testing? Have you, are they, are they, are they habitable at those height? Is it, is it, a, is it, a, is it a quality place to live or work or even visit, for example? So I, I'm, I'm quite skeptical. I think there will be taller buildings for sure and they may inch up a little bit, but I think it, it not in my lifetime, surely will there ever be uh, a mile high skyscraper in my opinion. So with that, Carol, I, that's all I had. Well, thank you, Bob. That was, uh, that was uh, ultra uh, tall in terms of the amount of information, uh, fascinating information with incredible clarity of explanation. So we really appreciate that. Um, we, I didn't invite people to uh, um, pose questions in the chat, although people can do that maybe for the next five, five or 10 minutes. Um, and if possible, we'll answer some. Uh, I'll mention that um, there's a chance that Bob will turn into Cinderella at seven o'clock when, as you can see, he's come into the office in Chicago, uh, Thornton Dumps that he's office and they may turn the lights off, we don't know. Uh, but you've had the, um, the, the benefit of the background of seeing the wind tunnel models uh, is in his, uh, in his uh, background landscape, and uh, that's often a, a green screen. But he he actually has made um, the effort to go into the the quite vacant office. So Bob, we appreciate for that, and we hope you're going to stay. My pleasure. My in pleasure. The light. <laughs> in the light for that. It's a, it's awful lonely here. So. <laughs> Well, hopefully in, in just a couple of months, it will be uh, populated again and we'll return to normalcy. But one of the um, strange advantages of, of our current condition is that we have been able to take advantage of people, um, not just from all over the country, but from around the world in order to, uh, to tap into your expertise, which um, has so um, tremendously advantaged the discussion uh, from, from one uh, lecture to the next one, week to the next. And I, I do want to preview our um, next two talks in, in this series uh, for the engineers of uh, now skipping one week. And it's a wonderful segue for Frank Lloyd Wright because uh, we, we do have a Tuesday night series, which uh, in this series is interrupted by our author's talk series. And next Tuesday, Anthony Olofsson will talk about Frank Lloyd Wright in New York, um, a new book by him, uh, and a, f a focus in his talk on Wright's uh, tower designs in New York, which are the St. Mark's and the Bowery, and then uh, the visionary project for the uh, modern cathedral, which Wright imagined um, way back in the 1920s would be 2,000 feet tall. So, uh, so um, about the, the size of, um, well, sh shorter than the Burj Khalifa, but certainly um, a super tall by those characteristics. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting to be able to see the similarities of Wright's system of um, design and engineering. Uh, and of course, in one person, he combined those, those attributes of, of design. Um, and, and Wright developed this taproot scheme, which is predicated on concrete, which is not the way, as I emphasized, skyscrapers were built in the, in the 1920s or really through the 20th century. So I wonder if you, you might um, talk a, a little bit about uh, con the concrete core and um, the, the mile high scheme, which I, you know, uh, obviously I, I defer to your expertise about the buildability of it, certainly looks like a visionary project for a mile high, high tower that couldn't be realized at the time. And what you've made clear to us is the technology has changed so much with computerization and, and composite materials. You know, in, in every way, the advances in technology um, that were necessary in order to go to 600 or, or um, 800 meters are a very modern invention. But I wonder, wonder if you might reflect on, on um, you know, those, that relationship. One of, the, one of the things that was kind of interesting when we were, we were designing the foundation scheme uh, for the tower, 
it, it, uh, it took some uh, un slightly unusual uh, paths, let's put it that way, in terms of the design. So we ended up with, if you, if you notice that diagram that I showed, it had 105 meter long piles in the center part of the building and about 45 meter long. So the longest piles were in the center of the building. And as it turns out, it's not because those are the most heavily loaded piles. It's because we were trying to stiffen the whole foundation system. I could talk for a whole hour about the foundation design on the tower. But what, what, is, uh, what I thought was interesting when we were doing that, uh, Pete Weismantel and I were in an air, I think we were in Frankfurt and I was telling him what, what we had come up with and how we're gonna present it for that trip when we were in, to Jeddah. Uh, how we're going to uh, present it to the, the owners and some of the other stakeholders, peer reviewers, and so forth. And he said, you know, this looks like Frank Lloyd Wright's Taproot Foundation. And I said, I said, you know, I, I thought the same thing when, when we were working on it, because that's that's what it looked like in some of the diagrams that you see from, uh, from the Mile High proposal that he had. He called it Taproot Foundation. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And um, I will try to read a couple of these um, chat questions. Maybe I'll, I'll go off the screen while I do that. Um, but I, I wonder if you could um, describe um, a, just a, a little bit more as a, a narrative, the relationship of the team and how in the competition, engineers and architects work together when they're not within the same firm, but um, are, are you know, assembled from, their, from the different expertise and different companies. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think it's too different. Um, you know, you have to realize that Adrian and Gordon, uh, I worked with them for 23 years. <laughs> so so it, it was almost, as Pete, Pete said the last, last week, he said, it was, we met the uh, enemy and they are us. <laughs> so so it, it, it was, it, was uh, it really isn't all that different. You know, it, it's, um, uh, you know, when you're on these tall buildings, I think, if an, arch, if an architect is a experienced uh, tall building designer, he, he realizes that it's not gonna pay to uh, have the structural uh, engineer designing things that are expensive or unbuildable. He really, he has to make sure that this, the structure is going to be uh, feasible. Otherwise the building will never be built. And someone who's ex as experienced as as Adrian Smith and Gordon Gill, they know that very well. So, you know, they they supported us every step of the way. Yeah, I mean, there's negotiations that go on uh, all the time in terms of where the walls are, uh, how far they can extend, you know, what we can live with, and so forth. But the fundamentals of the design uh, has to be carried along in an interdisciplinary way. All the all the disciplines have to be involved. And uh, I don't think it matters whether the structural engineer is in-house or not, because I've seen it from both sides. I, I was interested that you ended the, um, the lecture on the, on the issue of monitoring. And um, I, I did want to mention uh, again that the, the um, structural engineers who will follow you in the series after we interrupt with, the, with Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Mark Sarkeesian uh, from the San Francisco office of SOM is going to return to a kind of historical um, reflection on the role of the building that he um, designed uh, the, the engineering for when he was um, at, at SOM or as he is at SOM, uh, the Jin Mao Tower in Shanghai as a kind of uh, prototype for the uh, subsequent development of the core, the, the open atrium, the bill, um, no, that Peter, uh, Pete Weismantel uh, talked about last week. Um, so we, we do want to kind of go back to the late 20th century, pivot to China, but also to pivot to concrete and developing the typology that you, you laid out for us. Um, and then your colleague at Thorne Tomasetti, uh, Dennis Poon, will We'll talk about uh, a, a very interesting building also designed by Adrian Smith and, and Gordon Gill, the Chengdu Greenland Tower, uh, as a, I guess, a non-coplanar exoskeleton structure, very 
interesting and innovative structure. Uh, but Dennis, um, Dennis has, has worked on Shanghai Tower, as you mentioned, and, and other of the Thornton Tomasetti projects that go back to Patronus. So um, I, I'm, I'm pleased in the way that we've kind of bracketed the, the late 20th century developments and their connections, which are explored really in, um, well, more than a couple of firms, but, you know, especially with SOM and, and Thornton Tomasetti, and then a, a number of, of, of the other firms that specialize in super talls. Um, I wonder if you could comment a little bit about um, the specialty of super talls. Oh, then be before I forget, I want to mention the last of our lectures is Ahmed Abdul Razak, and, and he is going to talk about the lock, the lock to center tower in St. Petersburg, but uh, he wor did work on the Burj Khalifa. Um, and I know he's very keen on this issue of monitoring. Uh, uh, as the kind of you know real world um, uh, fulfillment of the of the testing um, theories um, that that get um, thrown up into uh, 800 meter towers. So that um, that call for uh, standards and unprecedented structures um, is something that I know that um, he's he's um, very committed to uh, and uh, and will talk about in his talk as well. So so. Um, is, it is it's the question really general question of expertise. What is the special expertise of, um, of super talls uh, that you think distinguishes the firms who are who have the capacity to work on these projects? Yeah. Well, I think it's it's an amazingly small group of engineers that are designing these buildings. It's only it's only a handful of firms and only a handful of engineers within those firms because it's a, you know, for developers, it's a, uh, it's a daunting proposal. You're, you know, Jenna Tower, for example, you know, they started with a mile high and they ended up with a kilometer. You're going to hire someone you, you think has the experience, both, both the individual and the firm to be able to handle that design. And then of course you still have to prove yourself every step of the way. So, I mean, experience is, is the name of the game. We used to say that if you don't have the experience, you're probably not gonna get the job because it's, it, and it's hard to break into the job, you know, in, into, the, into the business because you, you keep building on the knowledge and progress from one project to the next. And I think that's been true almost from the beginning. I mean, Hal Engar is my mentor at SOM and, he used to say, we used to take one step and then the next project we would build on that one and we would go off on a different tangent perhaps, but everything that was done was in a, in a systems and developmental methodology. And I think that's probably still true today that you build one, one project on another, but uh, I, I like your, uh, when you, uh, I was gonna mention Ahmad uh, Abdel Razak, your last speaker, because he, I think he is on the contractor side. So he has much more of an ability to push through the health monitoring. And uh, he's, he's actually a pioneer on that topic uh, far more than I am. And uh, I, I'll be very interested to hear his, his thoughts on that because that really would advance the art of designing these very, very tall buildings. There, there is this strange um, contradiction in the in the super tall that uh, all of the drive to build ever taller and, and ultra tall is is uh, it deals with as you illustrated with the, the wind the wind speeds the unknown wind speeds deals with un unprecedented situations um, to, to go into the uh, into the Excess the uh, into the unknown in effect a kind of Star Trekian kind of yeah. of ambition um, is something that you that you must do because no man has gone um, before but yet the caution um, that uh, Bill Baker and others um, and and you make clear is that the construction needs to be entirely familiar and very simple. Otherwise, the, the building won't be realized because no contractor will approach something which is truly unknown. So the difference between unknown and completely familiar and standard is a very um, fine balance um, in, in which to operate. 
and you you have to take account of the local uh, capabilities because not everyone can just work in the kingdom, for example. So we, uh, Saudi bin Laden Group is the contractor, and they we knew that they were going to probably be building the building almost from the time of the competition. So we, at every step of the way, we actually had a lot of meetings with them. It wasn't that we finished our design and handed off some drawings for open open bid. It wasn't like that. They were they were actually part of the project and were on the project from the very beginning. I think that's a big advantage uh, for these tall towers because there's only a few uh, companies that are going to take take the uh, opportunity and have the courage to uh, see them through. So I, I tell people that you know you know the days of the uh, of uh, architects and engineers actually building are gone. We design now and we can't. We can't build it for them, but we can help them and we can make their life easier. Or we can like to make their life miserable. And uh, this one, we went, we went really out of our way to make it as simple to build as possible, slabs and walls. And there was enough challenges and there will be challenges when they get up to the, the, the you know, heights in five, 600, 700 meters. We know that from some of the other tall buildings that the wind speeds start to have an effect on construction. So there's gonna be plenty of, Plenty of uh, challenges on the construction without having the complexity of the structure itself adding to them. And I think that's important when we look at the systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, I suppose, uh, end um, with some of the suggestion of, of my introduction about the, the future of masonry as a defining feature of, uh, of super tall buildings buildings. Uh, so do you think that concrete is here to stay? Uh, or you mentioned some innovations in terms of strength. Do you think there will be innovate, innovations in materials that will um, have will will seed a next uh, a next phase of, of tall building construction? Well, I think I think there's developments that are have already started that will come to fruition in the next five to 10 years. And I, I mentioned before the concrete industry has some real challenges and they they don't necessarily have to do with tall buildings, but they will affect it uh, dramatically. And that's particularly the issue of embodied carbon and Portland cement. But, um, you know, people ask me, you know, what, what, would the, what would such a structure even taller be? I said, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be concrete. It's probably going to be in a place that has the foundation capacity because uh, you know, a lot of places around the world just they don't have the geotechnical capacity to be able to support such a thing. Uh, it'd probably be in a fairly moderate wind climate, my guess, uh, and a few other things. But but concrete, uh, American Concrete Institute is has has devoted a lot of research effort and resources to new technologies, new materials, and new construction methods uh, to improve concrete and. Uh, it's, and I think it's paid off, but the fundamentals on, on how the buildings behave in terms of the motions, in terms of the resistance to overturning, all point to concrete in my opinion for, for these type of ultra tall towers, no, no question in my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we'll continue to explore that in the next couple of talks um, and uh, actually three, three talks. And I invite people to come back in order to take a little more of a history lesson about Frank Lloyd Wright and his design for skyscrapers. But um, in the spirit of thanking Chicago for its architects and engineers, um, Bob Sin, thank you so much for uh, the way that you illuminated this um, subject for us tonight. So uh, I hope- Carol. Yeah, I hope we'll see you all um, in the next uh, four weeks or so. Everybody tune in next Tuesday at six o'clock um, and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the ninth of the lectures in our Worldview Designing Global Super Tall series. Uh, tonight's lecture, as you can see on the screen, is Robert Sin, Bob Sin. Uh, from Thornton Tomasetti Engineers uh, in the Chicago office. I'll introduce him a little more fully later. Uh, and I wanted to give a little bit of background for both the series, uh, as well as uh, kind of set up for some of the themes that Bob and I have discussed um, that he is going to focus on in, in tonight's talk. Um, his title and a topic that we wanted to certainly include 
in the series is how do we go ultra tall? And he's going to describe to us what ultra tall is. Um, this is a topic that of, um, of the competition for the world's tallest buildings that is certainly unavoidable. It's a persistent um, theme and it is an irresistible urge uh, for clients, for architects um, and for structural engineers. It's a topic that hasn't really motivated this series, uh, which is looking at a category that we call, well, the Skyscraper Museum calls super tall and accompanies the exhibition, which we uh, hope dearly to be able to open up to the general public when the museum opens sometime um, in, later in the spring or early summer. And uh, that show called Super Tall, originally 2020, looks at a category of building that is 380 meters or taller, um, which is the height of the Empire State Building. So it's taller, taller than the Empire State Building uh, as a typology of principally the 21st century. And it's that idea that we've been exploring in particular uh, through the lectures by the architects, but especially by the engineers. Um, and so this part, second half of the series is called Engineering Super Talls. Uh, it is uh, a six part series on engineering, especially and, and the construction of towers. Uh, and you see that Bob is the third in the series. I hope you've already seen Bill Baker and Pete Weissmantel who spoke um, uh, especially about the, the Burj Khalifa. So this unavoidable topic of the world's tallest building. Uh, and Bobson is the structural engineer having worked at SOM um, during the time of Burge and spent nearly 20 years um, in the architectural firm uh, in the engineering um, specialty within SOM. In 2007, he moved on to uh, Thornton Tomasetti and there he leads the team uh, of, of structural engineers for the Jetta Tower. Uh, you'll see it in a few minutes. A uh, few moments, but um, now under construction, but stalled uh, in the desert of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, a building that will be a kilometer tall. So even though we haven't focused much on the subject of world's tallest building um, as as a theme itself, but rather as this category of super talls, this um, it, if if we want to ask about world's tallest building, we have the lineup of the men who have um, designed and, and, and engineered them um, in our series. So um, we are going to explore um, with Bob the expertise um, and the particulars of that tower. The, especially the second half of the series is dedicated to our, um, our, our um, departed now, Leslie e. Robertson, our dear friend, a board member of the Skyscraper Museum, uh, who passed away in, in February, uh, a great structural engineer and a great human being, the engineer of a world's tallest building. Um, and that topic of world's tallest that is evoked through this chart um, of ever taller buildings, the next in succession of the world's tallest from um, back in 1890 in New York with the uh, world building up through the Burj um, Khalifa that you see at the far right. And just about in the middle there uh, are the uh, World Trade Center Twin Towers. Uh, under construction, a design, a structural engineering design by Leslie Robertson that you can see um, in this view is a building entirely of steel. In fact, Les used to um, tell, me, tell me about the, uh, the important uh, innovations of the World Trade Center as we were doing exhibitions and he helped, helped us um, to frame those. Uh, that, the, that the World Trade Center was, uh, was a building built entirely without masonry. And you can see that in this photograph with the um, exterior tube construction that supports um, the, the structure and the interior, um, both architectural and structural core made entirely of steel. Uh, that tradition of a steel cell skeleton construction goes back to the 1880s and especially in Chicago in the 1890s, as you can see um, in these evocative um, historical slides. Uh, and it is a commanding definition through the, um, the three quarters of the 20th century, um, perhaps 
best exemplified in the expression of the of the steel skeleton on the exterior when this when the, the grid of steel is still present um, within uh, in that structural system of the um, uh, of uh, Mises Seagram building. Uh, and the, the definition that still um, one finds on a, a website today um, by the August um, uh, academic institution and, and museum, the, the Getty Research Center, uh, and their definitive art and architecture thesaurus, as you can see when you go down to a note for the definition of skyscrapers, they, they describe as an exceptionally tall buildings of skeleton frame construction. So a point that we made with Bill Baker's talk um, is uh, that this is his definition that may hold well through the um, uh, through uh, the, the 1970s, especially the World Trade Center or the uh, Sears Tower. Um, but it's a, a definition that doesn't, that isn't supported uh, today uh, by almost any of the super talls that are built in our, in the worldview that we're taking um, of global super talls. And um, this structure on the rise is the Jetta Tower of, of designed by the team from Thornton Tomasetti and led by our speaker, Bob, Bob Sin. If I can be successful in going back one, yes, one, one slide. Um, I just wanted to mention that this is a topic that we explored historically in uh, last fall in a series by historians looking at the technological advances of the steel skeleton, like a kind of series of firsts um, that uh, that characterized the innovations of the uh, last couple of decades of the 19th century, where um, the idea of steel, of, of a century of steel um, took root because it really described the advances uh, that, that, um, that propelled the skyscraper skyward. Uh, but that definition today and that that page of the website actually gives a quote by Bob Sin, which I found very startling when I came across it in a lecture that he um, had given, I think at Lehigh University that I saw on video. And during that talk, um, much um, like the one that he will um, share with us today, he talked about the, the Jetta Tower as a pure bearing wall. And so unlike the World Trade Center where Les Robertson um, would, would tell me, here is a building built entirely without masonry as the tallest building in the, in the 20th century. Now the, tall, the current tallest building in the 21st century and the one which um, will perhaps if completed exceeded in height is a pure bearing wall. In other words, it's a, it's a masonry structure. It is liquid, liquid stone, concrete um, poured vertically uh, in order to create um, a structure that Bob will describe as simplicity itself, where the walls carry all of the weight, not, um, not a frame, certainly not a frame of steel, though steel exists within the structure, of course. Um, so I um, am going to, I think I've already uh, included some of the uh, uh, credits of Bob Sin in his uh, career, first at SOM, where uh, for about two decades, he worked on many projects, including um, the super tall in Chicago that uh, um, a, a Trump um, built, uh, but uh, also uh, around the world in a, in a, a number of, of places where he worked on um, on, on skyscraper uh, projects uh, in Korea, in the Middle East, uh, and now is um, working uh, on, on many projects, um, though he's going to focus in particular on this question of um, how do we go ultra tall in the 21st century and help us to understand the typology as it develops um, in our time. 